friends, welcome again to Panorama of Prophecy. And we're coming to you live from Sacramento, California. We'd like to welcome those who are joining us across North America and around the world. We also like to welcome those who are here in person, part of our group that's coming out every night to study together. And we're glad that you are here tonight. We have a very important subject that we're going to be studying entitled the cleansing of the sanctuary. And I hope you all have your lessons when you came in. I know we have our, our row hosts and ushers up there that are handing out lessons. So hope you get your lesson when you come in. Also for our friends who are joining us online, if you don't have a copy of the lesson, just go to the Panorama of Prophecy website and you'll be able to download lesson number 11 and you can study along with us. We also have a free gift we want to tell you about, a book entitled Blood Beyond the Veil. And we will make this free to anyone who asks. All you have to do is text the word blood, B-L-O-O-D, to the number 40544 and you'll receive a digital download of the book. Now, if you're outside of North America and you can't text, you can just go to the Panorama of Prophecy website and you can click on the link there for the free offer and you'll be able to read the book right there online. So take advantage of it. The book goes along with our subject today, talking about the cleansing of the sanctuary. Now, as we always do, we have a theme song that we like to sing at the beginning of each of our programs. Are you folks learning the words of our theme song? You should. You'll have it memorized by the end of the series. So I'm going to invite you to stand as John Lomacain leads us again in our theme song, Help Me to Know Your Will, Lord. Help me to know your will, Lord, that I might follow Thee. Make me to hear that still, small voice tenderly calling me. Show me the truth that frees us. I want to do what pleases you, so help me to know your will. Lord, please help me to know your will. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, how grateful we are to be able to gather together and open up your word, word once again and study a very important subject, one that we find in the Old Testament, but also is spoken of in the New. And it has to do with what you, Jesus, are doing for us right now in heaven. So we ask in a special way that your spirit would come, guide our hearts and our minds, and, and just lead us into a clearer and fuller understanding of what you are doing for us and what you want to do in us and through us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. As always, we appreciate your Bible questions that come in from night to night. For those of you who are here in person, you can write down your Bible question on the uh, little card or on the paper, the notepad that we gave you. For our friends who are joining us online, again, we want to remind you to go to the Panorama of Prophecy website and you'll be able to type your Bible question right there. And we'll try to get to as many of these questions as possible. So we'd like to invite Pastor Doug and Karen and they'll come out and they will lead us in our Bible questions today. Thank you, Pastor Ross. And thank you, John and Kelly, for the song. Hi, friends. Good evening. How is everybody? Good evening. Good to have you here. I want to welcome those who are also watching on television or Facebook or YouTube. And again, we want to thank the networks that are carrying this program. They're, just, they're donating the time. We sure appreciate that. For Three Angels Broadcasting, the Hope Channel, which is Hope TV, for Secrets Unsealed Ministries, Better Life, and if I've forgotten anyone, please forget us, or forgive me, but uh, no, don't forget us. Forgive me. <laughs> but uh, we're so glad that we can dedicate some time each night to uh, answering Bible questions before we get into our deeper Bible study. All right, are you ready for the Mrs. first one? Bachelor, yes. Do you, are we in the middle of the stage? Are you happy this time? Yeah, this is better. I okay. like it. Yeah. I felt, like we were, I felt like we were kind of, you know, favoring We the still are. You sign. should scoot over just a tad. There we go. See, these are in the middle. She's okay, I'm better now. Here we go. Director. Are only those who keep the Sabbath going to heaven? Yeah, we presented the Sabbath truth during the seminar, what the Bible actually says. And some might be wondering, are you saying that all those who didn't know this are lost? Absolutely not. Uh, there's going to be all kinds of people in heaven that uh, lived up to the light they had. 
Now, for example, there is a commandment, the uh, seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, and that would, I think, include that you're not supposed to have more than one wife at a time. Are there going to be people in heaven that had more than one wife at a time? Yes. Yes, there are. Uh, King David and Solomon and Jacob and, you know, I always thought it was interesting that um, tells us that Abraham lived 175 years, Jacob lived about 137 years, Isaac, who lived between the two of them, lived 180 years. The only thing I can come up with is Isaac only had one wife. Are you waiting for my comment? No, I just okay. wondered if it registered. I'm listening. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody asked Benjamin Franklin one time, they said, can you show me one scripture that says a man can't have more than one wife? He said, oh, that's easy. No man can serve two masters. Amen. That's right. That's right. So, to back to your question, so, you know, there, there are going to be people who uh, didn't know the truth about the Sabbath or what day it was, but, you know, God's gonna, when we live up to the light that we have, God wants us to be faithful in that. And God's going to have people that it'll be surprising for us when we get to heaven. Someone said there's three surprises when you get to heaven. Surprise number one is that you're there. Surprise number two, you're going to see some people there that you never thought would make it. And surprise number three is that, um, I forget what surprise number three is. I forgot what your surprise number three is, too. Let's, Let's go, go over one question. more time. Surprise number one, you're there. Surprise number two, there's and some who's people there? who you thought would be there, there that go. are not there. Yes. And surprise number three is there's going to be some people there. You know, for instance, when you get to heaven, I really want to see what the reaction is when uh, Stephen, who is there, he's in our lesson tonight, last time he sees Saul of, Tar of Tarsus, he's participating in his execution. He's holding the cloth. The and cloth. then he's going to see the angels carrying Saul around on their shoulders in heaven. And he's going to go, what are you guys thinking? He said, this guy was the arch fiend of Christians, and here you are celebrating him. And the angel's going to say, oh, he went through a real conversion. Right. And so we're going to be surprised, I think, when we get to heaven. But we can still have assurance that we can, that yeah. we're saved. What's going to be really interesting is, will David be in heaven? Yes. Will Uriah be in heaven? Yes. Will Bathsheba be in heaven? Yes. Seems like it from what you read in the Bible. That'll be an interesting reunion, if you know the story. <laughs> All right. Are we going to stop at a destination before we reach heaven? Well, the Bible doesn't say, it doesn't tell us how long it's going to be. It does say in Revelation there's silence in heaven for about the space of half an hour. In prophetic time, that's seven days, if a day is a year in prophecy. And some have speculated that, you know, God could take us to heaven in the flash of an eye. He may be making it as a procession that will take a few detours through key planets or places in the universe to just help everyone. You know, when I prayed, they kind of plan the route so they get the most participation. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. I guess but, we'll uh, have to be ready so we can go. I just want to be in that procession. Amen? Yes, amen. All right. We have several questions about heaven. In heaven, will children grow up? Yes, probably more slowly. It tells us in Malachi chapter 4, it says, they shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And so uh, it says a little child, you know, was, was children growing part of God's original plan? Yes. Sure. So, of course, they're going to grow. They'll probably grow more slowly. It seems that in the Garden of Eden and shortly after Adam and Eve left the garden, people lived longer and that they also matured more slowly because you see some of the patriarchs didn't get married until they were like 90 and 100 years of age. And so uh, that's why you've got that verse in Isaiah. It says the child shall die 100 years old. It doesn't mean children die. It means that child does not even cease being considered a child until it's 100. But ultimately, they will grow up. I mean, what parent... Well, you know, sometimes you get a puppy and they're cute and they turn into dogs. You kind of wish they could stay puppies. But then you don't want them to stay puppies because they chew everything up. So it's All a trade-off. Right. Well, so when these children grow up, will they be able to be, get married in heaven? That's what the other part of the question. You know, uh, I saw that one coming in, and there's a verse in Mark. I, I get this a lot when I go to schools and I do, like, worships and I do weeks of prayer at academies and schools, and the teenagers often say, Will we be able to get married in heaven? We think Jesus is coming soon, and we're afraid that he's going to come before we get married and have children, and how will I ever be happy in heaven? And I say, you just get there, and I promise you'll be happy. But this is what the Lord says. He was uh, in a discussion with the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and they're trying to trap him. 
And they said, you know, a certain woman, she married a man and he died, and then she married his brother and he died, and then she married his brother and he died. First of all, I wouldn't have married her after three or four. I would have figured she's bad luck, right? But after she marries the seven brothers, she dies. Who is she married to in heaven? Her favorite. <laughs> there you have it. And Jesus said to them in Matthew chapter 12, verse 24, you are mistaken because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels. See, God told Adam and Eve to be fruitful and fill the earth. The earth is going to be populated with the redeemed. God did not intend for people to procreate indefinitely until we spilled out all through the cosmos. So I, the plan was to populate the earth. So uh, in heaven, now here's the question. When Adam and Eve get to heaven, does God hand them divorce papers? No. So if you have a couple and they have, you know, a normal marriage and they become one flesh, uh, in heaven they can still be best friends. It's not like God says, okay, you can't be married anymore. If they want to live together, they can live together and, and continue to love each other. But in heaven, it doesn't appear that there's procreation, intimacy, or birth. Uh, but uh, Jesus makes it pretty clear. That's the only statement. He says it once in Matthew, once in Mark, but it's pretty much the same statement. So what will we be doing in heaven and on the new earth? Yeah, we had a study on that, but we remember some people aren't at every study. Um, we're going to be doing very real things, all kinds of endeavors. Um, you know, for one thing, nothing dies. So you're probably not going to be, cut, you know, cutting down trees in the forest. It seems like everything's made out of mineral in the new earth. It says we will build houses and inhabit them, and we will plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. I believe we're going to be able to travel throughout the universe. God's going to move the capital here. We will be his ambassadors. And I think as we go through the universe, we'll be singing the praises of God who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light, talking about the goodness of God and glorifying him. And the made in his image will be his representatives. So we're going to be busy with practical things. We'll be able to explore new worlds, talk to intelligent life on other planets but there'll be nothing scary, you know, no aliens gobbling each other up. And, and so um, it's going to be just a very interesting, and you know, it's one of the reasons I believe in God. Scientists can't figure out if evolution is true. Why did humans evolve with 80% of their minds unused? Why would, you, why would you develop and evolve so much of your brain that never is used? And so uh, we're going to be learning and growing all through eternity. Amen. After a million years, my head will be this big. Oh, no. I hope not. It's hard enough to <laughs> carry you around. <laughs> All right. Um, if we confess our sins, and he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, as it says in 1 John 1, 9, um, and Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness. If I ask Jesus to forgive me from all of my sins, but I turn away from God in a short, and I sin again, does that mean I get punished for all the sins that were previously forgiven? Well, let me tell you two things. One, in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18, there's a passage. and It's, it's as plain as it can be about if a person, you know, they're, they're following the Lord, they love the Lord, they serve the Lord, and then they turn away. And it tells us that uh, verse 24, Ezekiel 18, when a righteous man turns, he's a saved person, when he turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity, and does according to all the abomin doesn't mean if you slip and fall. It's talking about you've turned away from righteousness. And does according to the abominations of the wicked man, shall he live? All the righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered because of the unfaithfulness of which he is guilty and the sin which he has committed, because of them he shall die. So it's, being a Christian is not just starting the race. You want to finish well, right? As Paul says, you want to run that race with endurance. He said at the end of his life, I have finished my course. You've got the story in Matthew 18 of this servant. He's called the unmerciful servant. This king forgives him an incredible amount of 10,000 talents that he's wasted. He prays for mercy. The king says, you're forgiven. But then he goes out and he mistreats a fellow servant that owes him a little bit of money. And the king calls him back in and says, shouldn't you have forgiven your fellow servant as I forgave you? Because of your wickedness, I am canceling your forgiveness for that whole 10,000 talents you had earlier. 
So some people say, well, 90% of my life I was a Christian, so I'm only going to pay in the judgment for 10% of my sins. Nothing in the Bible tells us that. It's all or nothing. I want all my sins forgiven. Amen? And so uh, that's why it's not just asking once God to forgive your past sins. You want to serve the Lord. It's not just for what's in it for you. It's because you love God and you want to follow him. Okay, so this question also was, what happens if I've asked God to forgive me and then I sin and then I get into an accident and I die? Yeah. Will I be forgiven or will I go to, where will I go? What will happen? Yeah, a lot of people, they, they say, you know, I, I'm serving the Lord, but if, if I die before, after I sin, before I have a chance to repent, right? well, first of all, do not think that God is up there waiting to catch you off guard so he can take you out. That's right. But at the same time, the devil would like to do that. So don't give him the opportunity. If you do fall, keep short accounts with God. Repent right away. And it's a dangerous thing to presume on God's grace. But he doesn't want you, if you've been a consistent Christian, he doesn't want you living in fear if you slip unintentionally. Mm -hmm. God has provided mercy for that. Amen. And it's not, you know, there's a great quote in the book called Steps to Christ where it says it's not the occasional good deed or misdeed that determines whose side we are on, but it's the habitual words and act. Mm -hmm. What's the tenor of your life? Are you following Christ? Um, you know, even Peter, there in the garden, he denied Jesus and Jesus forgave him. He repented, but Jesus forgave him. All right. How many symbols are there in Revelation? Now, we included this question, not because I thought I could answer it, because there are hundreds of symbols in Revelation. Some of you in the lesson when we gave you, I think it was a study on the Word of God, it had a symbol chart in it. And if you don't have that lesson, we hope you get it. We also gave away, I think, a special chart. For example, when we talk about symbols in Revelation, lamb represents who? Jesus. Jesus. You can speak up here in our local class. The dragon is who? The devil. The devil, Satan. Uh, when it talks about um, a sword, what does a sword represent? The Word of God. So some of these are very clearly established symbols, a lot of uh, other references. There are 404 verses in the book of Revelation. Matter of fact, Amazing Facts is working right now on a devotional, a one-year devotional, where we're pretty much going through the whole book of Revelation verse by verse. Wow. So we'll have to squeeze a couple together to get 365. But out of the 404 verses in Revelation, 278 of them are found other places in the Bible. Revelation talks about these creatures around the throne of God. One's like a lion, and one's like an eagle, and one's like a man, and one's like a calf. That's almost an exact quote from Ezekiel chapter 1. Same kind of vision. And so being acquainted with the Old Testament prophets helps unpack the meaning of Revelation. Revelation is, is just an amazing, amazing book in that it's almost like a jigsaw puzzle of the whole Bible that comes together at the end and paints a picture of Jesus. That's why it's called the revelation of Jesus Christ. So there's a lot of different symbols in there. And uh, yeah, I can't go through them all with you, but I, I bet there's uh, must be 50 different symbols I could think of. How do I get rid of bitterness? Well, you overcome evil with good. You know what helps me when I'm tempted to be bitter or unforgiving? I think about how much God has forgiven me. I see Jesus on the cross for my sins. And uh, the magnitude of how much he's forgiven me makes it easier for me to view the sins of others uh, in their actual light. Um, and I'm assuming you mean bitterness against others who maybe hurt you. Something else that helps me is when people have been unkind, I realize that if someone's in a lost condition, it's perfectly normal for them to be unkind or to do mean things. Because either a person has got the Spirit of God and the love of Jesus, or they don't, which means the devil is influencing them. And it's almost like a mental illness. Whenever people don't have the Lord, you've got selfishness controlling you, and they're going to do selfish, mean things. And you just pray for those people. Jesus said, love your enemies. It's hard to be bitter against someone you're praying for. So pray for them. I pray that God will take it out of your heart and help you forgive. He will. Sometimes you have to pray several times. Those thoughts keep coming back and you've got to keep rejecting them and it gets easier. Yeah, bitterness will only hurt you yeah. because the person that you're upset with or hurt from, they don't always care. They don't even pay attention to you um, knowing that you're upset or hurt. And so it only hurts you. So the sooner yeah. you can forgive and move forward, the better off you are with your health, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. Isn't that right? Yeah. 
That is. And uh, someone once said that unforgiveness or bitterness is a poison that destroys its container. Yeah. And so you don't want that toxin in you because it, it may not hurt them, but it'll hurt you. It's bad for your health and everything. That's right. So for our last question tonight, if God knows where the Ark of the Covenant is, why doesn't he lead someone to it? Well, I'm sure he does know where it is. And, um, you know, this reminds me, this question reminds me of when Jesus rose from the dead and uh, Thomas was not there that Sunday night when he first appeared to the disciples. And they later told Thomas, you should have been there. Jesus appeared. He's alive. And he said, unless I see the nail prints in his hands, unless I put my hand in his side, I'm not going to believe. About a week later, Jesus shows up again, and he says, Thomas, put your hand in my prints. And go ahead, thrust your hand into my side and be believing. You believe because you see. Jesus said, blessed are those who believe who have not seen. And so Christ and the Lord may be wanting us to believe. We know it's in the Ten Commandments, and it's in here. It's not a long document. About 300 words, the Ten Commandments. That's what's in the Ark of the Covenant. It would be wonderful, and it may be discovered. Wouldn't that be something? But uh, if it's going to happen, it'll be in God's timing. But it's not a mystery. We know what's in there, and uh, I believe God's got a copy in heaven. That's why Jesus said, heaven and earth has to pass away before one jot or one tittle in any wise passes from the law, because he's got the original. So uh, uh, who knows what will happen? And then people sometimes say, God knows where Noah's ark is. Why isn't that discovered? Who knows? It may be. But blessed are those who believe without seeing. Amen? Amen. And we're going to be studying that book that I hope will strengthen your faith in our program tonight. That's right. Tonight we're going to be favored with a, a beautiful song presented by Pastor John Lomakang and Kelly Maurer, and they're going to be sharing I Must Tell Jesus. must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. I must tell Jesus he will deliver. Make up my trials quickly and end. tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. I must tell Jesus all of my trials, He is a kind, compassionate friend. If I but ask him, he will deliver, make up my troubles quickly and end. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, yes, Jesus can help me, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Amen.
Thank you, Kelly and John. Sure appreciate that. We need to tell Jesus sometimes what our, our needs and our, our uh, desires are. Welcome again, friends. I want to welcome those who are watching the Panorama of Prophecy. And tonight we're going to live up to our name. We're getting into some industrial strength Bible prophecy study. It doesn't get any deeper than we're getting tonight. So I hope that you'll take a deep breath and ask the Lord for the Holy Spirit to just guide you. Matter of fact, as we get into our study, why don't you join me in having a prayer and lifting our hearts. Father in heaven, Lord, we're going to look in your word tonight. And we're just praying for wisdom. Help these important studies that talk about your return and how you sanctify us. I pray that they're very clear. Be with me as I share. And we pray that Jesus is exalted and ask in his name. Amen. Last night we talked about the sanctuary, just kind of giving an overview on that divine design. And it was really part one in our study that deals with the subject of the temple. And there's a prophecy that you'll find, there's actually a couple of prophecies, in Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 9, we're going to be looking at the longest time prophecy in the Bible tonight. And uh, I want to remind you, this is so important because it tells us the Antichrist power is going to be sitting in the temple of God, showing himself he is God, and much of the world has been confused about what is that temple that the Antichrist power sits over. You know, a magician uses something called sleight of hand and diversion. And what he'll do is they direct your attention over here, and they're just so good at getting people to focus on something here that nobody's paying attention to what's happening in their other hand or in another spot. They always get you to focus on something they want you to focus on. The devil's got a lot of the world focusing on a distraction, and they're missing what's really going on right under their noses. And we'll be unveiling more of that in this uh, seminar as we proceed. Just a little review very quickly. As we talked about the divine design last night in that uh, Bible sanctuary, we learned that the sanctuary is telling us everything about Jesus. It tells us that Jesus is our high priest. Doesn't it say that in Hebrews? And uh, there was a high priest in the temple. They sacrificed the lamb. Jesus is our lamb. Jesus said, I am the door. There was only one door into the sanctuary. Uh, Jesus is the altar. He's the one who died as our sacrifice. He is the living water. In the courtyard, you had the fire, you had the water. Jesus said, you must be born of the Spirit. And John the Baptist said, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Pentecost, tongues of fire. You must be born of the water and the Spirit. There was water and fire there in the courtyard. Then we have the three things in the holy place. The bread, the light, the altar of incense, those are the disciplines of the Christian life. Let your light shine, be a witness, eat the bread of life every day, and uh, through prayer, that's the altar of incense. And then the word of God must be the center and the foundation. Thy word I've hidden in my heart, in the holy of holies, were those stones with the word of God inscribed upon them. Jesus is our rock. Jesus is our sanctuary. It's in his name we pray. He is the light of the world. He is the living water. So the whole sanctuary is telling us about Jesus. Then we learned that uh, the sanctuary on earth is modeled after a temple in heaven. And so when we're talking about the Bible temple, you've got three tabernacles in the Old Testament. First one they built in the wilderness. Moses instructed them to make it. It was portable, called it the tabernacle. That eventually kind of fell apart, and David supplied the, the plans and the materials for his son Solomon to build the most glorious of the earthly temples. That one lasted for about 400 years. It was then destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. This is all in your history books in fifth grade. It talks about that. And um, after the Babylonian captivity, the Persian king let them go back to Israel. They rebuilt it. It wasn't near as glorious. But Herod the Great came along, and he wanted to go and embellish it. He spent years fortifying the earthly sanctuary. And even during Jesus' time, they said, you're going to destroy this temple in three days? It's taken us 42 years to build this temple. Well, that was the one that Herod had renovated. It was the temple of the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. That was destroyed by the Romans, and Jesus foretold that would happen. Here's another prophecy. Christ said, when the disciples showed him the temple, See you not all these things? 
There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. He said, this generation will not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. Bible generation is 40 years. Remember God wiped out that generation because of their unbelief. They had to wander for 40 years. Jesus made that prophecy in 30 AD. In 70 AD, the Romans destroyed the temple. There has not been another earthly temple since then to the present day. But Jesus was very zealous about the temple. This was his idea. The plans came from God. That's why at the beginning of his ministry, when Jesus was, was teaching and he went into the sanctuary, he often taught in the temple. You remember the story of the woman caught in adultery, John chapter 8. He was teaching in the temple. They brought him this woman. And he was very zealous of the temple. And when he would go for the various feasts, most of Jesus' ministry was up around Galilee, but he'd come to Jerusalem for the Jewish feasts. They had turned the temple into a flea market. It had turned into a bazaar. It was like a circus because Josephus tells us 250,000 people came to Jerusalem for the Passover and they'd get there because they're traveling. They can't bring their sheep and their goats. They would sell them and it was a great business. They would sell sacrifices and people were buying oxen and goats and sheep and doves and at exorbitant prices. And then they say, oh, you can't buy things in the temple with the Roman money. That's, un that's unclean because it's got Caesar's picture on it. You have to now convert it to the temple money. Then you can buy it with the temple money. Of course, there is a currency exchange cost. And they were robbing the people. And Jesus walked in and he saw that spectacle. He was outraged. And this leads us into our study for tonight, which is called Cleansing the Sanctuary. Jesus did this twice during his earthly ministry. And it also reminds us of a cleansing that happened in the earthly temple and in the heavenly temple and in the church. Very important study. So when Christ walked into the sanctuary, and you'll find this in uh, well, Matthew, Mark, Luke, they all talk about this. John talks about this experience. And he saw this carrying on. He said, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. The Bible says the temple was to be a house of prayer, not just for Jews. Solomon said, for all people. It's not just the Jewish God. He's the God of all people. Amen? And he said, it's supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations, and you've turned it into a den of thieves. And Jesus, just by his word, it tells us he made a whip of cords, but it doesn't say he whipped anybody. He stood there with that whip, and they looked at him as judge, and they were overcome with terror. It's like they were looking into the eyes of the Almighty. And everybody went scampering out, and Jesus went by, and he threw over their money tables, and all the money went clanging down to the floor. All the animals were kicked out of their cages, and they went stampeding out of the sanctuary. And in a few minutes, they were all gone, and it was quiet. And then it says the children. He wasn't mean, because the children came in, and they sat and listened to him, and the children were singing. And so uh, people think Jesus went around the temple, and he started beating and whipping people. That's not what happened. He just spoke. But he cleansed the sanctuary from all the worldliness that had come in. In the Old Testament, they had a service where they cleansed the sanctuary from the sins that had been symbolically stored there through the year. We touched on that last night. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. God wants to cleanse that sanctuary. Jesus often healed people, didn't he? He said he wants us to have an abundant life. The church, what know ye not that ye, plural, are the temple of God, Paul said to the church. Whoever defiles that temple, him will God destroy. Tells about this antichrist power that sits over the temple of God, a defiling influence. And then the Bible tells us that he's got a temple in heaven. Christ cleanses them all. He is the great temple cleanser. So we've learned last night, it's in Psalm 77, verse 13, your way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God, Psalm 77, 13. So we're going to take a look at a prophecy that was given to the Daniel, uh, uh, a prophecy that was given to the prophet Daniel that you'll find in Daniel chapter 8. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn there. And um, this, these are two prophecies between Daniel 8 and Daniel 9 that ends up being the longest time prophecy through history, and it talks about the cleansing of the sanctuary. In fact, I'm going to have you jump right to um, Daniel 8, verse 14. 
And then we're going to lead up to it. And the angel said to me, for unto 2,300 days, then the sanctuary will be cleansed. What is going to be cleansed at the end of this time? We'll get to that. First, I want you to go back, and you can look in Daniel chapter 8, verse 1. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, to me, Daniel, after the one that appeared to me the first time. That's in chapter 7. I saw in the vision, and so it happened while I was looking. I was in Shushan, in the citadel, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in the vision that I was by the river, uh, Uli. And then I lifted my eyes and saw, and there was standing beside the river, there was a ram that had two horns. And the two horns were high, and one was higher than the other. And another one came up last. And I saw the ram pushing towards the westward, northward, southward, so that no animal could withstand him. Nor was there any that could deliver from his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. And as I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from the west across the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Then he came to the ram that had the two horns, which I saw standing beside the river, and ran at him with furious power. And I saw him confronting the ram, and he was moved with rage against him, and attacked the ram, and broke his two horns, and there was no power in the ram to withstand him. But he cast him down to the ground and trampled him, and there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. Therefore the male goat grew, goat grew very great, but when he became strong, the large horn was broken, and in its place four notable ones came up towards the four winds of heaven, meaning north, south, east, west. And out of one of the four horns that came up in this uh, goat was a little horn that grew exceedingly great towards the south and towards the east and towards the glorious land. And it grew up towards the host of heaven. And it cast some of the hosts and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host. That's Christ. And by him the daily sacrifices were taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifice. And here's the, the main thing. He cast truth down to the ground, and he did all this, and he prospered. And then I heard the Holy One speaking to the other Holy One, these angels that are talking in Daniel's presence. How long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation? You've heard of the abomination of desolation? the transgression of desolation and the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot. He said unto me, for 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Okay, we read it, and now we're going to review what we just read, but you've got the biblical, I wanted you to get it right from the Bible, context for all of this. But before we go to question one, it's always fun to go on the street and find out what do people know about the sanctuary. What do they know about the cleansing of the sanctuary or the temple? Let's find out what some of our, uh, our interviewees have to say about that. The sanctuary in the Bible, I think, was used to protect the Ten Commandments. Yeah, I, you know, I'm not a scholar on that, but didn't they have it like the temple was a very specific, it had to be built in a very specific way. And in some of the early books of the Old Testament, it talked about, uh, you know, the exact dimensions of everything and that sort of thing. And wasn't there a veil? And uh, you couldn't go behind the veil or something like that. It's, it was the sanctuary um, it's where God reside uh, when he came to visit the, the Jewish people. Um, and so that we take a lot of what the Christian church, um, still some of the things that are done in the, the current modern day church are still things that came out of the original tabernacle that was built for God's place for him to reside. I may be way off it, but I think it's something to do with Jesus going through um, the book of life or um, accounting for everyone's sins kind of thing before he comes back. Uh, but I do not remember that one. Woo, baby. Uh, I think we better run, and uh, but some of us have to stand, and so I think that the cleansing will be a couple, I think that there has many applications to it. The first application is, is duck and run, <laughs> but I think that it is going to be so it's purified so that Jesus can come back to it. All right. When you, uh, 
you hear what people are saying about the temple and the sanctuary and the cleansing of the sanctuary, I think it becomes clear pretty quick that most folks are a little foggy on the subject, and yet it's a subject that you find from cover to cover in the Bible. Indeed, the whole prophecy of Revelation is transpiring in the sanctuary, as is some of the prophecies in Daniel, Ezekiel, Zechariah, Isaiah. Christians need to know at least the fundamentals about the temple because everything revolved around that for the Jewish nation, and it does play out in our lives today. Let's find out why. Question number one. Daniel had an amazing vision in which he saw a ram with two horns. Who does this ram represent? Now, the good news is later in Daniel chapter 8, you can see Daniel 8.20, an angel comes along and he says, I'm going to help explain the vision. So it's not like we went to the newspaper to find out what it means. There's no doubt about what it means. An angel in the same chapter says, here's what it means. So that makes it pretty uh, definite, don't you think? The ram that you saw having the two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia. You have Media, the Persians came up later, but Persian became much bigger. Most of it, history talks about it as the Persian Empire. Next question. Daniel then saw a goat with a great horn between his eyes. What does this mean? Before I go to the answer, it's interesting if you know your Bible, Daniel chapter 7 he has a vision of four animals. You get a lion and a bear and a leopard and a strange beast. They are all, according to the Jews, unclean animals. Now you get to Daniel chapter 8, and these are clean animals. The Jews were all shepherds, a goat, ram. They were clean animals that they used to have in their flocks. When Babylon was in power, they persecuted the Jews. The Persians and the, um, the Greeks they allowed them to, most of the time, they allowed them to practice their religion. So Daniel saw this goat with a great horn between his eyes. Who is he? The male goat is the kingdom of what? Greece. And the large horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Now this is really phenomenal when you think about it because when Daniel's making these prophecies, Greece, the likelihood that Greece was going to rule the world would have been unlikely when Daniel made the prophecy. Philip, the king of Macedon, father of Alexander the Great, he wasn't even alive then. And so the notion that they would at some point rule the world, they were just tribes up in the north of the Mediterranean there. And then later they foretell that Rome is going to rule the world. Rome wasn't much beyond Romulus and Remus, these twin brothers that were supposedly reared by wolves. They were just some tribes that were primitive. The idea that they would rule the world, you know, right now if I made a prophecy and said, yeah, in 300 years, Tasmania is going to be the world power. Nothing against any Tasmanians here, but I mean, who would predict that? And so you, you have to realize, we know that Daniel foretold these things before they happen. The very fact that he got the kingdoms right is one reason it's such a remarkable book. And he says the big notable horn, you know, you've probably seen rams and sheep fighting before they butt each other, and typically the one with the best rack of horns wins. But this big notable horn, um, that is the first king, which is no doubt Alexander the Great, because he dies early. It says, and when he is strong, he's suddenly broken. In his prime, Alexander the Great dies, just about the same age as Jesus. I think he was 32. He conquered the world, but he became depressed when his soldiers said they didn't want to march any farther and conquer any more. And he was at, had a drunken feast in Babylon. We don't know if he died from poisoning, from alcohol, Many speculate malaria because he did not die right away. And as he was dying, his young wife, Roxana, a Persian gal, she said, who will rule in your place? She was actually pregnant at the time. She was wondering, you know, is your son not even born? Is he going to rule? And Alexander said, the strongest will rule, which is what happened. He died. His empire was divided among his four generals. If that's our next answer. It says, and as that broken horn, horn was broken so that four stood up in its place, Four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation, but not according to his power. And so you've got the four divisions of the Roman, of the Greek kingdom, and that's uh, Ptolemies, the Seleucus, Cassiander, and Lysimachus. And so these four generals basically carved up the kingdom and um, to the four winds, north, south, east, west. And uh, there was a lot of strife and the Greek influence still spread around the world for years. 
Then a little horn sprouts up from that one of the four. What did this little horn represent? Now this little horn is the Antichrist power that you find other places in Daniel. He's in Daniel chapter 7. He's also found in Daniel chapter 11. And he is the power that Christ is talking about when he talks about the abomination of desolation. This is one that speaks great words against the Most High, wears out the saints of the Most High, and um, ultimately, uh, what do you call it, uh, he establishes the mark of the beast and begins to persecute those that will not worship the way that they're commanded to worship. This little horn sprouts up from one of the four. What does this horn represent? Well, we know that the, in the, one of the northern western empires of Greece, it kind of transitioned power to Rome. And you can read about this in Acts 18. What was the ruling power when Jesus was born? Claudius Caesar commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. Rome are the ones that imprisoned John when he gave the vision. He had been imprisoned by the emperor. And so then you get the Roman power. But the Roman power does not stay purely political pagan power. Uh, Christianity began to explode through the Roman Empire. It tells us that this little horn power goes through a transition. In this horn were like the eyes of the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. It says, he shall be different from the first ones. Just like when you get down to the legs in Daniel chapter 2, the legs are iron, but the feet are iron with clay. In this vision, you've got another power, but it's not quite the same because it's a commingling of religion and government. It is religious and civil. Now, what happened, just giving you a quick overview of history so that everybody knows. Um, as Rome was first established, you know, Christianity began to spread quickly through the Roman Empire. Even in Paul's day, he said that uh, the gospel's gone into all of the earth. But then, as the Christians grew, they began to be persecuted. The devil wanted to wipe them out. Christianity was declared religio illicite. Because there was so much connection between Christians and Jews, they both used the same holy book. And when the Jews rebelled against Rome, the Romans said Christians and Jews are forbidden religion, and they were terribly persecuted. You've heard about how Nero fiddled as Rome burned, and he blamed the Christians and Christians were burnt at the stake and they were fed to the lions and they died in the Colosseums, were slaughtered by gladiators. And uh, the devil hoped to wipe out Christianity through persecution. But the more they persecuted them, the more they grew. So then the devil came up with plan B. He said, if I can't destroy them from the outside, I will destroy them from the inside. I'll legalize it and I'll dilute Christianity. I'll commingle it with some of the pagan religions and with the conversion, or at least the pretended conversion, of Constantine the Great, the Roman Emperor, he legalized Christianity. His mother, Catherine, claimed to be a Christian. He said he was going to conquer under the sign of the cross. Everybody suddenly wanted to be a Christian. And all the pagans in Rome, they began to uh, say, well, you know, we want to be Christians, and they knew almost nothing about it. Constantine ordered his army to march through the Tiber River, and he said, now you're all baptized. You're Christians. He didn't really understand the teaching of baptism. They didn't know. Jesus said, go teach and baptize. They weren't taught. They had no idea. They went into the water dry pagans and they came up wet pagans. They didn't know. And a lot of the pagan priests didn't want to lose their status and they said, we'll convert to Christianity. And they said, but what do we do with all our idols? All over Rome. I think one historian said there were more idols in Rome than there were shingles on the roofs. There were idols everywhere. You can read about that in Paul writes about it in, uh, or Luke writes about it in the book of Acts. So they had idols of Mercury and Jupiter, Apollos and Venus and, and um, Diana of Ephesus. And they said, what do we do with our idols? They said, well, we can win more people from paganism if we give them Christian names. And so they started to rename the idols, Peter, James, John, Mary, Jesus. But idolatry is for, forbidden in the Bible but they said, well, you know, it's just to help them visualize these characters as they pray. And Christianity went through a, a major change where it went from being a religion of faith and love till eventually they were given an army and they began to use force. You've all heard of the Crusades. The church in Rome, at what point does it say the church moved from Jerusalem to Rome? The church in Rome 
became the ruling power for over a thousand years. And it became a political religious institution. Indeed, to this very day, the Roman Catholic Church is the only religion that is also a government. The Vatican is an independent country, and the Pope will address the United Nations. They don't let other pastors do that. And so something happened, and they began to persecute people that did not go along with what uh, the Bible teaches. And so we'll say more about this another night, but this was a big transition that happened that it talks about. Question number four. Daniel was told that this little horn would defile the sanctuary how long till it would be cleansed. So what happened is with the commingling of Christianity and paganism, for example, where in the Bible does it talk about purgatory, that you have to get burnt a little while to get cleansed of your sin? It's not in the Bible. Where does it say you're supposed to pray in front of idols, or is that forbidden? Where in the Bible does it say you must confess your sins to a priest? A lot of these things began to come into, and there's good Christian people in every church. I hope everyone's understanding what I'm saying. I'm just giving you history. And this is something that, of course, Protestants have talked about for centuries. You don't hear much about it now because it's probably not considered politically correct. But this is what the prophecy was saying is that a lot of truth would be lost. The truth would be cast to the ground. How long till this sanctuary would be cleansed? All right, we've got to stop for a moment and reestablish for any that didn't catch it what that sanctuary is. In the Old Testament, when God told Moses to build a sanctuary, he said it's patterned after the one in heaven. So you got the model sanctuary on earth, the tabernacle. You got one in heaven. How many is that? Two, one in heaven, one on earth. That was destroyed. Then there was Solomon's temple. Then you've got the one in heaven. How many is that? Two, right? Then that was destroyed by the Babylonians. And then you got the temple of Ezra, Nehemiah, King Herod. That's the one Jesus taught in. You got one on earth, one in heaven. How many? Two. And then that was destroyed, and now how many are there? Two. Because Jesus said, destroy this temple made with hands, and I will make one without hands in three days. But he spoke of his body at the church. So does God still have a sanctuary on earth? Has that sanctuary been defiled by the devil and false teachings? Has the truth been cast to the ground? Obviously, if there are 400 different Christian denominations and they disagree on certain crucial theology points, they're not all right. Uh, there are some false teachings that have kind of come into the Christian church because people have neglected the word of God. The sanctuary in heaven, whenever you pray and you ask God to forgive your sins, Christ takes your sins and uh, he pleads them before the Father. But is a time coming when there's no more sin in the universe? The sanctuary on earth, the church, and the sanctuary in heaven are going to be cleansed. And there's a process in that cleansing. And he, he wants to cleanse you. See, Jesus cleansed the temple. First temple that needs cleansing is your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And the Lord wants to cleanse that. Amen? Let me just give you uh, a couple more verses on this. For those who missed it, speaking of the beast power, there will come a falling away. It's when the truth is cast to the ground. The man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or worshiped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself he is God. And we just read in 1 Corinthians 3, 17, if any man defiles the temple of God, him will God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. How did Jesus feel when they defiled the temple? He chased them all out, didn't he? Ephesians 2.19, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or Gentile. And of the household of God. And we are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building fitly framed together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are builded together for a habitation of God. God not only wants to dwell in you, your body temple, God wants to dwell in his people, the church temple. You still with me? 1 Peter 2, 5, you also as lively stones, living stones, are built up into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. And then you go to Revelation 3, he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Now, I don't want to go to heaven and be a pillar. You just want to, all day long, you're a pillar? 
Or is he talking about you're going to be part of the household of God in that kingdom? So when the Antichrist power defiles the sanctuary, and when he sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God, that temple that needs cleansing is the temple on earth, his people, and there's a cleansing that happens in the temple in heaven. Let's go back to our vision. Daniel chapter 4, and this is question 4. Daniel was told that this little horn, and of course it's in Daniel 8, this little horn would defile the sanctuary. How long until it would be cleansed? We showed that to you twice now. For 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So we get this time period. How did Daniel respond when he saw the little horn power persecuting God's people and obscure the truth? At the end of this vision, when he sees the persecution, he sees what the future of God's people are. Daniel's an old man at this point. Daniel 8, 27, he says, I, Daniel, fainted, and I was sick for days, and I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. He knew the part about Greece and Persia and Rome, but he didn't understand this antichrist power, this little horn power that was going to persecute. So before the angel can finally give it all to Daniel, he faints, which means the angel has to come back and give him one of the most important things, which is what? Starting point for the time period in the prophecy. At the beginning of your supplications, go to Daniel chapter 9 now. I started reading too soon. I want you to go to Daniel 9, and um, here is the second part of this prophecy. Daniel fainted, so the angel comes back, and Daniel offers his prayer saying, Lord, how long will your people be captives here in Persia? He was reading the prophecies of Jeremiah. He said, when are they going to go home? When is the Messiah going to come? Is the prayer of Daniel's heart. And go to verse 20, Daniel 9, verse 20. Now while I was speaking, praying, and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, presenting my supplication to the Lord, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision, this is the angel, at the beginning, meaning chapter 8, being caused to fly swiftly, he reached me about the time of the evening offering, and he informed me and talked with me, and he said, Oh, Daniel, I have come now forth to give you skill and understanding. Daniel chapter 8, he said, I fainted, no one understood. Daniel chapter 9, he says, I've come back, even though it's quite a while later, to help you understand. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I've come to tell you. Daniel starts praying, and an angel comes from heaven. Do angels travel the speed of sound? which is about 700 miles an hour, depending on your altitude and air density. Speed of light, 186,000 miles per second. Or do angels travel the speed of thought? That angel went from God to earth in a very short time, being caused to fly swiftly. Talk about swiftly. No highway patrolman is going to catch an angel. And it says that I've come to give you understanding. I've come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. Understand what vision? Chapter 8 is the one where he fainted before he was finished. Here you go. All right, everyone awake? One of the most important prophecies in the Bible. When I first understood this, I literally jumped up and down. I'll try not to do that tonight. Seventy weeks are determined for your people. Who are Daniel's people? The Jews. And for your, for the holy city, now, 70 weeks. How many days in a week? Seven. Am I going fast? <laughs> seven days in a week. 70 weeks is how many days? 70 times seven? 490. Did Peter once say, Jesus, how often shall I forgive my brother? Seven times? And Jesus said, not seven times, but 70 times seven. How much longer was God going to bear with the Jewish nation to fulfill their destiny? Their destiny was to introduce the Messiah to the world. That's what happens in this book. He says, for, for, your, uh, for the people, for your holy city, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, lots happening here, to bring in everlasting righteousness, this is the mission of Jesus, to seal up the vision, to complete the vision that we study, to anoint the most holy. Who is the most holy that was anointed? Jesus, this prophecy is telling us when Christ would begin his ministry and be anointed with the Holy Spirit. The word Christ, Christos, you've heard of christening a ship? It's anointing. The word in Hebrew is Messiah. 
They both mean anointing. It means he was filled and flooded and saturated with the Holy Spirit. God in man is what you have in Jesus. It says 70 weeks. So the overall prophecy is 70 weeks. A day in prophecy equals what? A year. We'll give you the verses on that in just a moment. Know therefore and understand, I'm in verse 25, that from the going forth of the command, here's the starting point for the vision, from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. That's a total of 69. And the street will be built again and the wall even in troublous times. He's foretelling what happened in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah when they were rebuilding the, the temple and the streets and the walls. And after the 62 weeks, you got the, the um, seven weeks and the 62 weeks, and after this time period, it says the Messiah is cut off, but not for himself. The Messiah was cut off for who? For you and me. And the people of the prince who will come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. He's talking about when the Romans came. This next power was the Romans, and they would destroy Jerusalem and the temple. This broke Daniel's heart. And the end will be with a flood, meaning a lot of people, armies would sweep over. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. Going back to the Messiah, in verse 27, he will confirm the covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he will bring an end to sacrifice and offerings. Who caused the sacrifice and the offering to cease? When Jesus died on the cross and the veil was rent in the temple, do we sacrifice lambs anymore? The Jews don't even sacrifice lambs anymore. And on the wing of abominations shall one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined shall be poured out on the desolate. So you've got the abomination of desolation identified here. You've got the coming of the Messiah. I'm going to give it to you again if that was fast. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I have come to tell you. So the angel comes to explain this vision in Daniel chapter 9, and it's going on with the vision of Daniel chapter 8. In the next chapter, the angel explains the prophecy, and this is question six, in greater detail. How long was the time period not previously described in the vision from chapter eight? What's the answer? Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to seal up the vision and the prophecy, to complete this earlier prophecy. But he's adding another time period. Number seven. What was the starting point for the 2,300 day and the 70 week time prophecies? We got two prophecies that overlay each other. They got one starting period given in both chapters. It says, know therefore and understand, this is Daniel 9:25, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So you got a starting point. How in the world are we going to find in history the starting point for this command to restore and build Jerusalem? I got good news for you. It's in the Bible. In Ezra chapter 7, the decree of King Artaxerxes, the Persian king, is given, and it's a very easily established date in history. It is 457 BC. Now, you should have a chart in your lessons, and hopefully you will be able to obtain the lessons who are watching. You'll have that as well. So here's our starting point, but we've got to just reiterate. When it says uh, 490 days, in prophecy a day is a year. You can look here in Ezekiel 4, 6. I have laid on you a day for each year. Numbers 14, 34, each day for a year. Another prophecy in uh, Luke chapter 13. The enemies of Jesus came and said, King Herod, he's killed John the Baptist. You better be careful. You might be next. Jesus said, Go tell that fox, I teach, do cures, cast out devils today, tomorrow, and the third day I will be completed or perfected. Jesus made that statement about six months in his ministry when John the Baptist was killed. He did not preach for three more days. He preached for three more years. Even Jesus used the day for the year principle in his prophecy. So. Don't be thinking literal days because nothing significant happened 2,300 days after Daniel got this prophecy. The angel said that if you were to count 69 weeks from 457 BC, you would come to the Messiah, the Prince. Does it happen? Look at this. You can read in Acts 10, verse 37. 
that the word you know after the baptism, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. Jesus was anointed. You remember when he was baptized and he came up out of the water and the heavens were open. The Holy Spirit came down like a dove. Christ does no miracle before his baptism. Nothing recorded. And he begins his public ministry from that point on. Meets with the devil in the wilderness and defeats him. And Jesus then taught for three and a half years. Now, I hope you won't be upset with me. But do you know that uh, Christmas uh, was not December 25th? Now, I'm not the Grinch who wants to steal your Christmas, but be at least intelligent about it. We know Jesus died in the spring, right? The Bible says he taught for three and a half years. If you count back three and a half, and he was baptized on his 30th birthday. That's what it says in the Gospel of Luke chapter 3. You count back three and a half years from Passover, and it tells us that he would be born in the fall. The fall was his birthday. But we don't know the exact date, so we're not going to make a big fuss about uh, people celebrating in December. Is everyone clear on that? Okay, yeah, yeah. No, give me a lot of information here. So Jesus is anointed. And then you read in Matthew 1, So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son. They'll call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Jesus came. It tells us it was in 27 A.D., in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. He was 30 years of age. Christ was born about 4 B.C. I know that confuses people, but they got the A.D. B.C. dating method established before they really knew the facts. Here's a chart, and I know there's a ton of stuff that you're going to see on the screen up here. Maybe they can put that up for our local audience. So if you go from 457 B.C., go 483 years, it comes to A.D. 27, the very time when Jesus was baptized and anointed with the Holy Spirit, and he began his ministry. But we haven't gotten the whole 490 yet. We just get the beginning of that 483 years. There's still one week left. It says, in the midst of that last week, he causes the sacrifice to cease. Jesus preaches three and a half years. He dies on the cross. The veil in the temple is rent. He causes the sacrificial system to be fulfilled in him. That's all nailed to the cross. But why is there another three and a half years? All right, go with me in your Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. Not only did Jesus preach three and a half years, Jesus then exclusively preached three and a half years to the Jewish nation. And here we're going to find the story where Stephen is stoned. And you can read... Chapter 7, and hang on, let me get the right verse for you. Go to verse 57. After Stephen presents the gospel to the Jewish Supreme Court, the Sanhedrin, he says that we've crucified our Savior. They plug their ears. They don't want to hear it. They gnash their teeth. They run upon him. What does it mean if a Supreme Court of a nation plugs their ears? It's not good for the nation. They cried out with a loud voice. They stopped their ears. They ran at him with one accord. They cast him out of the city, and they stoned him. Jesus was brought out of the city. Jesus was stoned. Jesus prayed for the forgiveness of those that killed him. No, Jesus was crucified. He prayed for the forgiveness of those that executed him, just like Stephen. It says that they laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. It tells us that they divided Jesus' clothing. The same thing that happened to Jesus happens to the first Christian martyr, Stephen, Three and a half years later, Stephen dies. And Paul is there at the execution. Paul is converted. He becomes the apostle to the Gentiles. Now the gospel goes to everybody. You realize until the stoning of Stephen, the Jews, the apostles, were only preaching to Jews. This is in the lesson here. I'm going to give you some uh, revision of that again to help remember it. So that chart's there. I think it's also in your lesson. 483 years plus 457 goes to A.D. 26, but keep in mind, there's still one more year you add between the year 1 B.C. and 1 A.D. There is no year zero. That adds up to 27 A.D. This is when Jesus was baptized. 
What was to take place next in the prophecy? After the 62 weeks, you got the seven weeks, and the 62 weeks, at 69, Messiah would be cut off. Can that be misunderstood? Messiah is who? Jesus. In his prime, you know, the average person lives three score and 10 years, Jesus died 33 and a half. In his prime, he lays down his life at, in his best for you and me. He'll confirm the covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he'll bring to end the sacrifice and the offering. Now, friends, this is a verse that we can't get wrong. Let me just tell you, I've got a lot of evangelical friends. They say the one who confirms the covenant is the Antichrist. I'm telling you, and a lot of other Protestant scholars are saying it's not the Antichrist, it is Jesus. Where in the Bible do you find that the Antichrist makes a covenant with anybody? There's no salvation covenant. Does God have a covenant with his people? Did Jesus come to confirm that covenant? He is the fulfillment of the covenant God made with Abraham, that through his seed all the nations would be blessed. The covenant of salvation by faith is confirmed through Jesus for three and a half years, half of a week. In the midst of that last seven, he dies. Well, but how does he continue to confirm the covenant after he's died? Good question. It's in the Bible. Look in Hebrews chapter 2. You go to Hebrews chapter 2. And we have this prophecy given to us. You go to Hebrews 2, verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, first three and a half, and was confirmed. The covenant was confirmed through Jesus, and it was confirmed to us by those who heard him. For another three and a half years, he confirmed the covenant just to the Jews through the apostles. Christ said to the apostles, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. You need to complete the work that I've, I've uh, started. And even though the Jewish nation has officially rejected me, I am long-suffering and merciful. I want you to continue to preach the gospel to the Jews. And many were converted. When 3,000 were converted at Pentecost, what was their religion? Jewish. They were devout Jews out of every nation under heaven. 5,000 converted a few days later. What were they? Jews. The Bible tells us in Acts, many of the priests, even Pharisees and Sadducees, people like Nicodemus and Joseph, were converted. He said, I'm going to give you first chance. The gospel comes, it says, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. And so he confirmed the covenant for that last seven years of the 490 years with the Jewish nation. In the middle of that last seven years, Christ dies on the cross. He causes the sacrifice to cease. You remember where it says the veil in the temple was ripped from top to bottom? On the Passover, no less. The real Passover lamb was dying on the cross outside the city. Now, even after Jesus died and ascended to heaven, the Jews tried to revamp the sacrificial system. But I'll tell you, after that event there in AD 31, nothing was ever the same. And people who are looking for the Jews to rebuild the temple today, I, I hear Christians and evangelicals talking about it, but you talk to Jews, I don't meet Jews anywhere. And like I said, I come from a Jewish family. They're not talking about rebuilding the temple. I don't know any Jews anywhere. They're saying, I wish we could start sacrificing lambs again. I wish we could build a temple to house the Ten Commandments and we don't know where they are. There might be a few ultra-Orthodox Jews that are saying that, but that's not the temple that needed cleansing. It's us now. Jesus already took care of that a long time ago, the other temple, because the veil is taken away in Christ, that veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place. Now through faith, you and I can boldly go before the Father through Jesus. We have a high priest in his presence. Amen? Jesus told his disciples to preach first to which group of people? This is review of what I just read. Do not go in the way of the Gentiles, but go rather where? To the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I mean, I thought Jesus wanted them to go everywhere. To no, no. He said, don't go everywhere yet. The Jews have the first opportunity because they've got the whole foundation in the scriptures. And if you can convert the Jews and then send them out as evangelists, then you'll really reach people. But first reach them. So that first three and a half years after Christ, they were preaching to Jews. Number 11, what warning did Jesus give to his chosen people? The kingdom of God will be taken from you 
and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. Remember Jesus cursed a fig tree because it didn't bear fruit? It was kind of like the Jewish nation at that time where they had all the trappings of religion, but they didn't have the fruits of the Spirit. And Jesus cursed that fig tree and said, no man will ever eat fruit from you again. So now the blessings were to go to whosoever will. Everyone really becomes a spiritual Jew when we accept Christ. Number 12, so what is this other nation spoken of by Jesus which would become his chosen people? Now, God still has a heart for the Jews. Don't misunderstand. But the Bible is clear. In Christ now, Galatians tells us, there is neither Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. We are all one in Christ. Christ is not restricting it. He's expanding the promises that he gave Abraham and Isaac and Jacob to everybody. That's why Jesus said, many will come from the east and the west and sit down in the kingdom with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And some of the natural kingdom, children of the kingdom, will be in outer darkness. Uh, we can't be trusting our DNA for salvation. It's based on faith. Say amen, please. I want the folks at home to know you are actually here. <laughs> and if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed. Now, how many of you would say, I am Christ? Have you accepted Jesus? Shalom. You become a spiritual Jew. The Gentiles are grafted into the stock of Israel. There is no new covenant made with Gentiles. It is made with the house of Israel. We become at least spiritual Jews when we accept Jesus. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, Romans 2.28, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly. It's not physical circumcision. It's circumcision of the heart now. So let's review the 490-year prophecy very quickly. You go from 457 to 27 AD, Jesus is baptized. And that's the first 483 years that we saw. Then you go three and a half years from Christ's ministry. He dies on the cross. He tells the disciples, wait for the outpouring of the Spirit, and when you're filled with the Spirit, do not go to the Gentiles. Begin in Jerusalem and Judea, then go to Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. And that's exactly what they did. They preached first to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He confirmed the covenant in person for three and a half years, then he did the last three and a half through those who walked with him. And even the enemies of the apostles said, we can tell they had been with Jesus. They'd spent so much time with Jesus, they sounded and acted like Christ. This is the full 490-year prophecy. You know what this means? Christ came right on time, as Daniel foretold. He did exactly what he said. The, what happened with the nations happened exactly. This is what made me jump up and down years ago in the cave when I read this in my Bible. I thought, that means he said, I'm coming again. He's going to come again, just like he promised too. Amen? The time prophecies in the Bible never fail. This has stumped the critics. At the end, 34 AD, Stephen is stoned. Paul is converted. The gospel, it says, a persecution arose in Jerusalem, scattering the disciples everywhere, preaching the gospel to Jew and Gentile. And that happens in chapter 9. Paul is converted. In chapter 10, Peter preaches to the first Gentiles at the house of Cornelius in uh, Caesarea. And so all of it happened exactly as Daniel said in his prophecy. Paul is converted, and he's sent to the Gentiles. Number 13. According to the angel who spoke with Daniel, what would happen at the end of the 2,300 years? Oh, that's right, Doug. We started out in Daniel 8, said the sanctuary would not be cleansed for 2,300 years. What's talking about there? For 2,300 days, and a day is what? A year. Then the sanctuary will be cleansed. So, if you go from 457 and you go 2,300 years, that comes to when? 1844. That was a very interesting year in history. I had a whole list of things that happened in 1844. I do remember the first electronic message, the first text was in 1844. You've heard of uh, Samuel Morse. He sent the first Morse code message. You know what it was? Scripture. What hath God wrought? Very interesting. That changed communications of the world. Now, the Bible tells us that the sanctuary would be cleansed. There's a judgment that begins. Number 14, whose cases are being considered in this pre-advent judgment? You realize that some judgment takes place before Jesus comes. Follow me. When Jesus comes, is he giving rewards? Does he know who's saved and lost? The Bible says he'll come and reward every man according to his works. 
Does it make sense to you that some judgment must take place before he comes? With whom does that judgment take place? That's what this question is. Judgment, 1 Peter 4, 17, judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it begin of us, at us, what is the end of those that obey not the gospel? There is a judgment, and we'll say more about this, so if it hasn't all come together, we're going to answer your questions and we're going to expand on that. What will be examined in this first phase of the judgment? The dead are judged according to their works by the things that are written in the books. It goes on and says in Ecclesiastes 12, 14, God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing. And then finally, what's the criteria in that judgment? Who will be judged by the law of liberty. So, before the Lord comes, there's going to be a revival of truth. God is going to be cleansing his sanctuary. There's a cleansing of the sanctuary in heaven. All through the ages, people have said they're Christians, but the books are going to be opened before Christ comes and evaluate who were truly uh, genuinely converted. Talks about this judgment in Daniel uh, chapter 7, when the books are open. The Ancient of Days is there. It's all portrayed in the Bible. There's also a cleansing of the sanctuary on earth. How many sanctuaries are there? Two. What's a sanctuary on earth? You are the temple of God. What did the sanctuary on earth need cleansing from? The truth was cast to the ground. In 1844, God began a movement where the Bible truths that had been lost on a number of subjects, salvation by faith, that you're not supposed to pray to idols, the Sabbath truth, and many other things, a restoration began to take place. And that movement right now is spreading around the world. It's one of the fastest growing Protestant groups in the world today. And in this cleansing, is, it, is God done cleansing his church on earth? No, he'd be here if he was. When Michael stands up, when a judge stands up, it means case is closed. He issues decree. When Michael stands up and this great time of trouble comes, it's over. He's still cleansing the sanctuary in heaven. He's still cleansing the sanctuary on earth. You want to be part of that group. You want to be part of that sanctuary, his people, those living stones in the last days. Who is my accuser in this final judgment? That serpent of old called the devil was cast down to the earth. The Bible says he is the accuser of the brethren who accused them before our God day and night. The devil is there perpetually accusing. He tries to point out our sins. You can see him in the book of Job. He's accusing Job. And you can see in the book of Zechariah, he's accusing Zechariah or Joshua, the high priest. And you think the devil, he's got all the goods. The devil will tempt you to sin, and then he'll turn you in for sinning. So how can we survive this judgment when the devil's got all this evidence against us? He's the prosecuting attorney. Good thing is you've got a great defense attorney. That's Jesus. Must I stand alone in this pre-advent judgment? No, the Bible promises John chapter 2, verse 1, and if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And again, John 1, uh, verse 2, and uh, one, uh, 1 John 2, verse 1, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Everything in this prophecy that has been foretold has happened. We saw that in Revelation chapter 7, I'm sorry, in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, you've got the seven churches. The last age of the church, who knows what it's called? Laodicea. You know what the word Laodicea means? Judging of the people. You and I are living in that last age of the church that began in 1844. In the Jewish year, all year long, the high priest went through the daily sacrifices. Now, when Christ first ascended to heaven, he went into the Holy of Holies. He was enthroned. He activated the heavenly sanctuary. He was coronated, you might say, received his kingdom. At least in heavenly, it was, his uh, ministry was approved. Then he began his work as our high priest. But in the Jewish economy, at the end of the year, the high priest went in to the Holy of Holies to do a cleansing process, to cleanse the people from their sins permanently. When Christ comes again, the Bible says, he is coming without sin unto salvation. Is Jesus going to be burying our sins forever? Or at some point, is sin going to be eradicated from the universe? Revelation is very clear. There'll be no more sin, no more death, no more sorrow, no more pain. And Christ is 
He's, the books are being evaluated. You read in Ezekiel chapter 9, it talks about this judgment. And it says, begin with the ancient men before the sanctuary. A judgment in the house of God. There's going to be a cleansing of God's people. When Jesus went into that sanctuary with his cord and said, take these things, hence my father's house is to be a house of prayer. He not only wants that for his church, he's cleansing the sanctuary from the sins that have been stored in heaven. There's a judgment going on, but he wants to cleanse your temple. Would you like him to come in and do his work and to cleanse you and prepare you for his return? I'd like to invite John and, and Kelly to come up and John's going to sing a verse of a familiar song and then we're going to have prayer together. And I hope you'll be praying in your hearts at this time and say, Lord, wow, these prophecies are true. Come into my heart and cleanse me. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry. to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit, and oh, what needless pains we bear. It's all because we do not care. Everything to God in prayer. Karen's favorite song. Do you have a friend in Jesus, friends? I think Christ made it clear in these many scriptures we've looked at that he wants to cleanse us. He wants to cleanse his sanctuary. There'll be no sin stored in heaven. There'll be no sin in his people. He wants to purge us from sin. That's why Jesus came to save us from our sins. You want to let him have that work in your life? You who are watching, he wants to do that for you now. Come to him. He is in the saving from sin business, whatever your sins might be. Let's stand together and ask him as we close. Could we do that? Loving Father in heaven, we're thankful for the promise that Jesus saves, that he wants to save us from our sins. And Lord, we pray that you will do that now in the lives and hearts of each person here. Bless us, bring us back again to study your word. On Friday night, we thank you and pray in Christ's name. Amen. Our next meeting is River of Life Friday night. We look forward to seeing each of you there. Thank you, friends, and God bless you. We're going to give you a day off, but you won't forget about us, will you? <laughs>